Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Chronic Inflammation Summit. I'm your host, Dr. David Jockers. And today, we're going to be talking about mold, mold exposure, brain inflammation. We're going to talk about mycotoxins. We're going to talk about gut infections, things like H. pylori, parasites, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And we're going to talk about detox and healing strategies so you can clean up your gut and clean up your brain. And so this interview is with my friend, Evan Brand. And so Evan is a certified functional medicine practitioner. He's helped over a thousand plus clients with digestive issues, including parasites, SIBO, Candida, and H. pylori. He also works with mold, mycotoxins, and uses advanced lab testing and customized protocols. You can find him at evanbrand.com. He's got a great podcast. And so let's jump right into this interview. Well, hey, Evan, welcome to the summit. Thanks for having me, Dr. Jockers. Absolutely. Well, I always enjoy listening to your podcast and all the information that you're, you're, you're working on. And I know you're huge on organic acid testing, looking at mycotoxins, mold exposure. I know you've got a story yourself. Um, in fact, let's start with that. Let's talk about you know, your history with mold and mycotoxins. Well, you know how it goes when you do podcasts and interviews. You tell the story and then you tell it again and you're like, wait a second. Actually, the story goes further back than I thought it did originally. Originally, I would say that I got exposed to it after building a new house. But now telling that story a few times, I realized, wait a second. No, I remember being a kid in my grandmother's house uh, hanging out all summer and she had basement leaks and she had carpet in the basement. And when that basement flooded, she didn't have a mold remediator come back in. So they, they didn't do anything. They just turned on the box fans and it would take two weeks to dry out that basement. So my goodness, I guarantee I was exposed to insane amounts of mold, even as a kid. And I think what maybe nobody knows, right? This is all speculation, but I think what may have happened is some of the tick bites that I got over the summer may have weakened the immune system and allowed the mycotoxins to really take me down further or vice versa, that the mycotoxins were weighing me down and then the tick bites really kind of broke the camel's back. So I think it was a combination of that, which is which is really, really common. There's a guy named Dr. Neil Nathan. He's a medical doc. He's a cool guy. He wrote a book called Toxic, all about this issue. And I look into that book and he says the same thing. He doesn't really know chicken or egg. You know, it's different for everybody. But I do believe both of these issues, whether it's Lyme and co-infections or whether it's mold and mycotoxins, I think these are the biggest hidden epidemics in the US right now. And nobody has a clue. And the doctors are telling people they're crazy. And the psychiatrists are prescribing antidepressants. And no one's getting any better. And people are just getting more sick and more sick every day. Yeah, it's a really important topic. And so let's talk about what is mold? What are signs that people may have that in their house? Well, number one, duh moment, you're going to see it. But truthfully, it's rare to see mold. We didn't see any mold. We had a brand new house. We didn't see anything at all. Uh, it was actually uh, coming from the crawl space. So luckily, mm -hmm. we were able to remediate that and fix it and got it into perfect pristine condition, got it certified, checked off the list, and then we sold the property. But you know, it could be somewhere that you don't see, and then it's getting into your breathable air. So number one, duh, maybe you see it, but number two, maybe you don't see it at all. It's going to be different for every family. You know, genetically, these are where the differences come in. And so some people genetically, they don't recognize mold or mycotoxins, and therefore they don't mount any sort of immune response to it. And so this is why the husband tells the wife that she's crazy Maybe she is, but maybe not. Maybe it's just mold and she's sick from it and the husband's not because his genetics deal with detoxing the mold and mycotoxins and her genetics don't. So what we look for are family members that have an isolated or possibly a family-wide situation. So maybe every morning the wife wakes up with a headache. Huh, that's interesting. Or maybe every morning both kids wake up with a headache. Huh, that's interesting. We'll look for things like water spots on the ceiling. We'll look at history like, well, did you have a bathtub overflow? Did you have a sink pipe burst? Did you have something freeze? Did you have something break? Did your dishwasher overflow? It doesn't take much to create a, a toxic situation. 48 hours is really all it takes. So if you have a, let's say you have a kitchen sink that backs up and you got a bunch of food or you have a disposed all in your kitchen sink and that bad boy burst open, you've got a bunch of water leaking down on those cabinets underneath. If that thing's not dried out in 48 hours, you've got mold growth. And it's not mold that makes you sick. It's the mycotoxins that they produce. So since molds, 
just like plants don't have teeth. Everyone hears about oxalates and phytic acid and all these anti-nutrients in food. Same thing with mold. It makes mycotoxins. Mycotoxins are designed to basically kill out other molds and help these molds stake out their territory, so to speak. So the aspergillus is like, hey, stay away, penicillin. And penicillin is like, no, you stay away. And so they're like battling and they're off-gassing these mycotoxins that are battling each other. And here you are, the innocent victim, and you breathe it in. Now, if you breathe enough of this mycotoxin load in, it'll accumulate and it'll be stored in fat tissue. It can be stored in your bile. It can be stored in your brain. And this is why if you just look up okra toxin, okra toxin is a mycotoxin that comes from aspergillus. It's implicated in a lot of brain, neurodegenerative brain issues. And if you just type in okra toxin cerebellum, you'll actually find some papers on the fact that it literally damages the cerebellum, which is a part of the brain that's really important for your uh, like motor function, you know, coordination, balance, that type of stuff. So when we hear about people with dizziness, which is one of my main issues that I first had, uh, we think mold. Uh, mm. I got to credit my friend, Dr. Jack Wolfson. He's a cardiologist, our mutual friend. And mm -hmm. I don't know why, but oh, it was, it was the blood pressure. So that's another sign you may have mold is unstable blood pressure. And my blood pressure was just randomly going high, like 150 over 100, which is too high for me. I'm normally like, you know, 110 over 75, something like that. So I texted Jack because he's the cardiologist, right? Jack, I'm waking up with crazy blood pressure and I'm dizzy. What's going on? And he replies, all he replies is one word in all caps, mold. And I thought, no friggin' way. This, this can't be true. And he was right. So mm. Uh, shout out to Jack for helping me discover that his wife got real sick and she had a lot of issues with vertigo as well. It was tied into mold, um, sinus infections. We mentioned headaches, uh, food sensitivities are common insomnia because it affects melatonin production, weight gain or weight loss for men. A lot of times weight loss for women, a lot of times weight gain. Sorry, ladies, the inflammatory cytokines, they block your leptin receptors. So literally, you can eat all the grass-fed steak you want, but your leptin receptors block. So your body's like, oh, I'm going in fat storage mode. I'm starving to death. And leptin wow. has to do with fat burning and satiety. So when you don't, when you're leptin resistant because those receptors are damaged, you're not going to heal, heal the signal that says, I'm satiated, I'm full, I can stop eating, I can start burning fat for, fu for fuel, and then you start overeating. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of crazy what happens to you. Mood issues are huge. Depression, uh, anxiety is huge. Suicidal thoughts are huge. I share everything, maybe too much, right? I'm an open book, but hey, that's, that's what I like to be and do because my stories help people. So yeah. uh, here's a story that's crazy. My wife and I went to Barnes & Noble and we're in there looking around at books. We've got the little girls with us. We've got our kids. Hey, this is fun. I'm in the kids section hanging out with the girls. I look up at the ceiling and I see water damage on the ceiling. Mm. I thought, oh no, I see the vent. There's literally black mold growing out of the air duct. I thought, oh no, we got to get out of here. So we're on the way home and everything seems fine. And then out of nowhere, like the flip of a switch, I just have this feeling like, I hope my wife just drives us into the wall. I don't know why, but you know, I've had a good life and, and I'm done. I'm not depressed. I'm not suicidal, but I'm done. Just go ahead. Just mm. finish us off. Right. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Where am I coming up with these thoughts? And uh, after talking with, with several uh, mold literate uh, doctors, they said, yeah, you know, the, the suicidal tendencies or thoughts that'll pop up, it can happen after an exposure. So if you go, let's say you go to your grandma's house or your mother's house and you leave and you're like, the world is ending. Maybe it's not the stress of your family dynamic. Maybe it's you've been exposed to mold. So you want to be, the problem is most people are not in tune enough with their emotions to detect subtle changes like that. I'm just super in tune. So for me, I was like, whoa, my cognitive state is altered. I did not have a trigger. Yeah. This is weird. What was it? Uh, what else should I mention? I think I've hit, oh, vision, vision issues. So mm. that was another clue something was off for me is I started looking at the computer screen and everything would go like blurry. I'd, I'd blink and I'd say, oh my God, I can't see. And so I went to the eye doctor and he's like, your eyes are perfect. And he didn't say mold, but he says, have you ever considered Lyme disease? And I go, mm. wow, an eye doctor mentioning Lyme. I did have three tick bites over the summer, huh, maybe that's it. And I started treating myself for Lyme and sure enough, my vision started getting better. So 
Lyme and, and mycotoxins, they're in the same category because they can both create that Sears phenomenon, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. They can both be in the category of biotoxins that can affect various body systems. They can affect hormones. They can affect brain. So the good news is binders, charcoal, clay, zeolite, silica, chlorella, fulvic acids, those things can be broad spectrum to help with mycotoxins and or Lyme and co-infections. So regardless, if you're listening to this, regardless of what's going on, maybe you don't even know what's going on yet. You know, just a gentle binder could be a game changer for so many people. Yeah, binders are, are fantastic, like you were talking about. And um, let's talk about testing, testing for mycotoxins. And then we'll go into things people can be doing as well uh, in their home, as well as supplements, uh, food strategies, things like that. Let's talk about testing. Sure. So two main tests we're going to do. Number one, we're going to test the home using Petri dishes. A uh, good friend of mine now, uh, JW Biava, he owns a company, Immunolytics, out of New Mexico. They do Petri dish testing where you can put a Petri dish in your home in various areas of the home. After an hour, you put the lid on the Petri dish, you send it back to the lab, they let it grow for a few days, and then they send a picture back to you and they tell you with an analysis how many colonies of mold are growing on this Petri dish. Some have heard of the ERMI testing. I just like the Petri dishes. I really enjoy them. Mm -hmm. It's a good visual perspective to get people motivated, especially when you have a family member who's like, mold, you're crazy. It's like, okay, look at this picture. Does that, pe does that Petri dish look pretty to you, husband? He's like, oh, okay. And then the husband takes it more serious. So sometimes mm -hmm. we use it as just a compliance tool, but you want to have, according to their health score, you want to have less than four colonies of various molds growing. And we have our, our own line called Oasis. It's a whole line of fogging, misting uh, solutions that you put into fog machines and misters. It's pretty cool. They're essential oil-based. Mm -hmm. And you mist them or you fog, and then you retest the plates. I was feeling really weird, really tired when I was sitting on this couch that I bought, this brand new couch. So we did what's called a tap test. You take the Petri dish, you smack it against any fabric, bed, pillows, cushions, whatever. Slapped it against the couch cushion, let it grow. My God, if I had the picture, I'd show it to you. It was nasty. We had probably 15 or 20 colonies of mold growing out of this couch. And so new doesn't equal not moldy. And so we did the fog machine. I, I drug the couch into our master bedroom. I thought, well, might as well fog my bed too. Why not? So uh, per JW's advice, we fogged the room and jumped up and down to get the fog solution into the fibers of the couch. We retested and not only did the Petri dish look better, I didn't feel weird on the couch anymore. I didn't get tired. I didn't get like kind of head drunk and brain fogged. I felt clear headed on the couch. So, so that's amazing. And they're like $3 a plate. So how does, so how does the fog machine work? Is that like, like an essential oil diffuser or? Yeah. So it has a food based glycol in it. Mm. And that's what makes it really thick. It's like a thick syrup. And then it's a blend. It's a tangerine, lime, lemon, and grapefruit. And they're all mm. in there. Now, you can't just go and like drink essential oils. I'm not telling yeah. people to do that. But this blend with the glycol, it's literally like a fog machine, like for a Halloween party. You turn this fog machine on, it heats up the oils, and it disperses them into a literal fog. I'm talking, you can't even see your hand in front of your face when this wow. stuff is fully engaged in a room. And it just penetrates everywhere. So you'll open up all your cabinets, you open up your shower, uh, you know, like your dresser, you open up shower door, whatever you can do, you want this fog to penetrate everywhere. And you know how it goes with FDA and all that. So you can't make too many claims about it curing or killing or treating sure. mold. But let's just say that it makes the mold basically disappear if it's just airborne. Now, if you've got like nasty black hairy stuff growing on the walls, no, you have to cut that out. This is just a polishing right. tool. It's not a mold remediation tool in the sense that, hey, I had a water leak. There's mold behind my drywall. Is it going to fix that? It will absolutely not fix that. You've got to cut out any water damage materials and replace those. But once you've done that, the fog is the finishing touch. Yeah, this is important too. I'm, I'm interested to know, like for a lot of people, obviously they're in a mold damaged building or like, for example, their home, and let's say they move out of the home, but they still have a lot of mycotoxins on their clothing, on their furniture, things like that. Would it be possible to use this sort of fogging uh, on all of those types of things now that, you know, like, so they move into uh, a home that's free of mold, but they're bringing in stuff that had mold and mold spores and mycotoxins on it. And can they fog it to clean it up? 
you're thinking smart. I love the way you're thinking. The answer is yes, you definitely can fog it to clean it up. However, in some cases, depending on the sensitivity, we talked about this mm. Sears phenomenon. Uh, certainly for me, that was an issue because I brought one of my favorite sweaters. It was like this organic wool sweater from the mountains of somewhere. I don't know. It was this really cool sweater and I loved it. And so we do have uh, what's called an Oasis laundry solution. It's the essential oils, but in a more uh, less syrupy blend for the laundry, for the washer mm. machine. And so we put it in there and for like 99% of the clothes, it works uh, phenomenally. And people who previously had reactions to their clothing or fabric, you can save it. But that one sweater, every time I put it on, I got a headache. And I thought, man, I don't know if this is it or not. I can't confirm. Some may say I sound crazy, but I'm going to get rid of this thing just to be safe. And sure enough, I got rid of it and no more headaches. So in a lot of cases, yes, you can save fabrics and materials. But if it's something like a mattress, those are a little more difficult, especially if you have a yeah. multi-layer mattress because – it's hard to get everything penetrated in. Now, what I have now is like a three-layer organic latex mattress. I've gone through several mattresses over the years. Everybody wants to sell me a $10,000 mattress, and mm -hmm. sometimes they hook me up with good deals. So then I buy it, and then you know the deal. Yeah. And so anyway, the one I have now is awesome because you can take off the cover, and you can separate all the layers of latex. So you can separate the three layers. So I know if I needed to treat it, which I don't think I will, you could separate the layers versus a conventional mattress. There's no way you're getting the fog all the way through it. But yes, you are correct. This is a problem. This is why a lot of people stay sick is because they get out of the environment and they bring all their moldy crap with them. And so it's on their clothes, it's in their hair. Most importantly, it's in their bodies. And because of the process in the body called enterohepatic, you know, meaning it's going to be circulating through the hepatic biliary system, enterohepatic recirculation it's like a water hose connected to itself. You've got to break the chain and you've got to get these toxins out. And so this is why someone may take it like a sabbatical where, you know, they'll go to the middle of the desert because they think there's less mold there and they're going to feel better. And some get better because they have a chance to let their bucket drain out of mold toxin because they're not still getting re-exposed every time they go to the grocery store in Georgia where it's humid all the time, for example. Yeah. Uh, they can let that bucket drain. However, the bucket is still full. So they don't make a complete recovery until they use the binders to pull it out. And then also, uh, I'm going to go down a little tangent here, and then yeah. we'll go back to testing the body for mold. Yeah. So when it comes to colonization, we talked about earlier how mold can weaken the immune system. And so, in fact, mycophenolic acid is used to kill people's immune systems so that during an organ transplant, your body doesn't reject the new organ. So they'll, in medical facilities, they'll literally use these mycotoxins to kill your immune system. So let's say you get a new kidney, so your body doesn't reject it. That's how potent hmm. these things are as an immune suppressant. It's insane. Look up mycophenolic acid, like uh, organ transplant or something. You can read about it. But long story short, once the immune system is weakened, you can have two situations happen with mold illness. You can have, number one, you're a reservoir, meaning you went to a moldy hotel, you took your wife out for the anniversary, you went to an awesome five-star hotel that was moldy, and you got exposed over the weekend, and now you've got mold in your bucket. And maybe you're okay, maybe you're not. Now, the second situation is where a lot of people end up that come to me is, and they don't know this until we discover it with testing, but they end up as a mold factory, meaning they've been exposed to so much mycotoxin or so much mold that now they're colonized, meaning they're going to grow mold in their sinuses, they're going to grow mold in their gut, it could be in, involved with biofilms. And now the binders aren't enough because all the binders are doing is just pulling the mold out of the bathtub, but you didn't turn off the water first. So now we have to come in with using antifungals in the sinuses, using antifungals in the gut, and then we can really you know, gain the upper hand on this situation. So if yeah, you want to say anything on that, and then let's talk about the body a little bit. No, I think everything you're saying is really important. So yeah, let's talk about mycotoxins, mold exposure in the body. What are you looking at there? Yeah, so there's, there's two different tests. Uh, the one is called real-time labs, which yeah. I, I, I've done a few. I, I'm just not a huge fan, to be honest, because I love organic acids testing so much. Mm -hmm. I, I know you and I are yeah. mutual uh, lovers of Great Plains. And yeah, so Great Plains, yeah. We really like to do the combo tests where we're going to run the organic acids with the mycotoxin because it's easy for the client or the patient to just do one cup of pee, and then we're yeah. going to get the mycotoxin screen done. And so we like to have people do a glutathione provocation, just meaning that we're going to stir up the bugs, we're going to stir up the molds, whatever heavy metals, whatever we're looking for. We're going to stir things up with glutathione, which is your master detox antioxidant. It's made in the liver, but as you age and 
as you get exposed to toxins, you make less. So we use it in supplemental form to about five days before we test to kind of push more mold out. We find the test is more accurate. We find if we don't do that, then we just see the tip of the iceberg. So you may show up with a little mold toxin on the urine test, but once you start detoxing people and you retest, then you'll see a huge dump of mold come out, which is like, yeah. whoa, where did this come from? Did I get exposed? In most cases, the answer is no. It's just that they got better at detox. Yeah. So that's kind of a little bit of inside baseball there. But anyway, you wake up, you pee in a cup. I mean, it doesn't get any easier than that. And you send it back to the lab and then you can confirm not only what are your levels, but what type of mycotoxins do you have? Because not all binders are created equal. I've seen a lot of people saying, yeah, I'm taking this biotoxin, this and this binder. Okay, but the type of mold toxin you have, uh, those binders are not that effective. So I really like to have people get the data because zeolite may be good for zeolinone, which is a fustarium-based toxin, but zeolite's not very good for ochre toxin. Charcoal's better for that. So you may want to do chlorella for this one over here, and you may want to do pectin for this one. So hmm. you can use broad spectrum, but sometimes we'll do this kind of spot treat, for lack of a better word, where if we see primarily ochre toxin, there's no need to use fulvic acid. Hmm. We're just going to go in and go, and go charcoal. And so with the data, you can be more specific and you're not guessing, you're testing. So, yeah, so, really house, so house and then body, with those two pieces of data, you're going to really be able to help people. Yeah, it's really good to know. And now how about the organic acid test? Do you see any, any sort of uh, biomarkers show up if somebody is exposed to mold? Yeah, good question. So the test is getting better all the time. On page one now, the whole first section, I think it's numbers one through nine on the oat, you're going to see markers like tartaric acid. You're going to see uh, furan, carbonoglycine. You're going to yeah. see mm, methyl 2 ferroic. There's a few big yeah. ones at the top there. And then in parentheses, you're going to see aspergillus or fusarium. And that's where we can tell if someone's colonized. So yeah, if you see mm -hmm. those high fungal organic acids, you'll know, hey, you probably are colonized and we probably need to use some antifungals. Yeah. What kind of antifungals do you like to use? There's so many that you can use for the nose and the gut. For the nose, I like silver. I like Exlear, which is a xylitol rinse, but there's one called Exlear Rescue, which is the one with the essential oils. Super hardcore, but man, it really works. And then uh, we will use a formula we carry called Agrimax, which is a, it's like a grapefruit, it's kind of a similar citrus blend to the stuff we use in the fogger, but it's just in a a drop form and we put it in like a sinus irrigator with some saline and just boom, pump it up the nose. That stuff is hardcore, but it really works. And people that'll have- And that's, you know, that's grapefruit seed extract? Is yeah, it is. is. Yeah, yeah, it's grapefruit yep. seed, but it's also mixed with like the lime and the lemon and the tangerine. Right. So there's right. like four yep. in there. And it doesn't burn when they put it up their nose? A little bit. <laughs> a little bit yeah. yeah but but you've got the saline so the saline yeah. powder you're going to mix that in so that does calm it down quite a bit and then you've got the the opportunity where you know if it is pretty intense you could always do less dosing so instead of four drops maybe you do one or two and then if you follow it up with the x layer with the xylitol rinse that's pretty gentle so that mm. one's that one's pretty awesome and for kids a lot of time we'll get them to do the x layer just the regular version and then for the gut uh, I've got a formula I use called Microbiome Support 3. It's a blend. It's olive leaf. It's Paul D'Arco, thyme, French tarragon, tenal spora. Uh, you could use possibly oregano. Uh, systemic enzymes may be helpful. So some serapeptidase or uh, you know some type of alumbrokinase, some type of enzymes to kind of break down these boogers yeah. of bowel film. Uh, I like garlic could be useful, but people hate the smell. So you know you really make people smell. I'm sure you've. Uh, Play yeah, with if you're garlic just eating garlic, yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. So if you use some of these garlic extracts we have, you'll just smell terrible. Your wife or husband will kick you out of the bed. You got to change the sheets every few days. So we try not to use that unless we really have a big problem. But I think a lot of the olives, the Paul D'Arcos, yeah. kind of those, you know, standard antifungals, those work good. Now, you know, I'm not a medical doctor. So if you talk to a medical doctor, they're going to say Sporinox, Citraconazole, Fluconazole, Diflucan. I mean, look, maybe drugs are good in some cases, maybe they're needed in some cases, but when you have the Center for Disease Control freaking out right now about antifungal resistant mm. issues, I mean, years ago it was antibiotic resistant bacteria, right? These superbugs like C. diff and stuff. Now you have super fungus. And wow. so you've got this new strain of Candida, Candida aureus. It's this new tropical strain of Candida they're finding and the drugs aren't working. And so 
call my bias the way you want to call it, but I'm, I'm a bigger fan of using the herbs. So I'm kind of biased towards those. And I don't want to say I'm anti-pharma, but I've seen people do the Diflucan, fluconazole, kind of standard MD antifungal drugs, and they're no better. They're not, they're not, you know, we'll test their oat test and they still have fungal overgrowth. It's like, Mm. whoa, you did Diflucan for six months. You still have this much fungal overgrowth. Holy smokes. So that's my Well, the good thing about the herbs, the herbs also help support the immune system. They're also bitters that help support stomach acid and bile flow and pancreatic enzyme production. So they support your digestive tract. So you're getting a lot of different benefits that are part of the process of sweeping that fungus out. So the, you know, the idea of getting the fungus out is really not just killing it or even just binding it, but also just supporting the whole digestive system and helping optimize the immune system. And that's what these herbs do. Yeah, that, absolutely. Great point. And, and you're, you're making the host a stronger, more resilient person because one argument could be, well, why was the host so weak where they could become yeah. colonized anyway? I mean, mold's been around forever, right? Yes and no, because we use drywall with paper backing. We use building materials that humans have never used ever before. And we have water pipes behind our walls. I mean, we do crazy stuff in the modern world with building, right? So, so you, could, you could do the whole, well, mold was in the Bible. You, you could bring all that stuff up, but they were using plaster. They, they didn't use drywall uh, when, in biblical times. And so we are at more of a risk. We do make houses that are much more prone to mold. So I would argue that anyone could be susceptible. However, like the olive leaf and stuff like that, it is antiviral and it is, you know, there are some immune boosting components. So I don't want people to get too caught up on the kill, kill, kill detox. At a certain point, you have to do that, but it should also be, well, what can I do to strengthen me? Like, was I so yeah. stressed and that's why I was weak? Was I staying up too late at night? Was I, you know, scrolling on Instagram at 12 o'clock and, you know, eating crap and, you know, not relaxing yeah. and not hanging out with my kids. I mean, what else was I doing to weaken me? Yeah, I mean, it's so true. It's like a seesaw or like a, a weight scale where, <clears throat> you know, the stronger and more resilient your body is, the more potentially, um, you know, the, the more potential toxins you're able to handle without having a dip in your health. You know, everybody has a bucket and the better that you are at, um, you know, emptying the bucket on your own, it doesn't fill up quite as quite as fast. I'm sure you're, you're familiar with the bucket theory. So it's like, we all have this bucket. Once the bucket overflows, that's when we have chronic symptoms. But along the way, the bucket was filling up and we didn't even know it. Now, the more resilient we are, the more that we're detoxing that bucket. And so we can handle exposure. We can go into Barnes & Noble, even if it's got black mold, and you know be, be able to be in there for 20 or 30 minutes and not have any symptoms because of it. And so that's really where we want to be because really avoiding mold altogether is pretty much impossible. I mean, we're, we're, we're around it all the time. It's a very, very hard thing to do. Um, you can certainly stay in your home, keep your home as clean as possible and minimize your exposure, but you're going to get it at some point if you want to live any sort of life, right? So, oh yeah. Um, and so the key is building that resilience. That's what we got to do. Yeah, so, let me take that. Let me take that bucket yeah. comment a, a step further. So, you know, some people will report that they feel better on binders, even though they're not out of the moldy environment. Mm-hmm. Now, I work with a lot of teachers, so a lot of schools are moldy because the budgets are low, and if the roof leaks, they don't properly repair it, and all of that. And you know, they try to save money during the summer when kids are out for the summer, so they turn down the air conditioners. The humidity builds up. You know, especially in the South, humidity builds up in the schools, and then the teachers go back to school, and then in August, September, they all have sinus infections again, and they're exhausted and they've got food sensitivities and all that that are popped up. So it's a very, very common situation. Now, some people will report, well, I feel better when I'm doing binders. I'm like, cool. If the rate of detox, you know, the rate of the bathtub drain is draining faster than your rate of exposure, then you can gain the upper hand. Sometimes you just tread water, meaning your rate of exposure is equal to your rate of detox. But if you do enough binders, in some cases, even if someone's still getting exposed, they can't get out of the moldy apartment, they'd have to break the lease or whatever, they can't sell their house yet. At least we can do, the least we can do is get these people on a good protocol, you know, the glutathione, the appropriate binders, potentially the liver, the bowel flow support, like you mentioned, the immune support, the adrenal support is key, the antifungals. And then we can still gain the upper hand. So it's not hopeless. I don't want people to listen to this and say, oh my God. Evan's overwhelming me. I have to move. I have to sell my house. I've got to move to the desert. Not necessarily. There's only one case or two cases where I told people, you absolutely have to get out. It was a woman in Oregon 
who had a, a leak from her kitchen sink for years and her whole kitchen island was just like a big old ball of mold toxin. Mm. I mean, every time she washed dishes, she was so dizzy, she almost fell over from the vertigo. Wow. And then we had a lady, I think she was in Oregon too, or Washington. So the hot spots for mold in the US at least, the South, so, uh, you know, Kentucky and, and, and South, you know, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Louisiana, North Carolina, South Carolina, that whole bottom right section, the whole Northeast section, really because of the moisture. Uh, yeah. you, you could almost argue the whole country Areas except high humidity. High yeah. humidity. Yeah. Yeah. So you could almost argue the whole U.S. minus Nevada and Arizona, pretty much, and New Mexico. Yeah. You know, those are kind of the only three states where you don't have a ton of humidity. But anyway, uh, and even with that, like, um, I just recently interviewed somebody from my podcast and she was in Arizona and they had a water leak, right? So you can't really do much about that. If you have a water leak, you know, you're going to, you're going to build mold. Yeah. So, 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 so don't everybody go to Phoenix. There's already enough people there anyway, but don't move to Phoenix yeah. thinking you're going to escape it because yeah, you're right. I mean, and then in all these desert climates, they often use swamp coolers, which then add too much humidity to the mm-hmm. house. And then you have mold growth that way. But either way, this other lady, uh, she was up somewhere in the Northwest quadrant and she had a two and a half million dollar house and she loved it. And I was like, this house is killing you. You, you literally got to get out of here. And the husband's like, he doesn't believe it, blah, blah, blah. And they stayed there and she just dropped out of care because she didn't like what I had to hear. I gave her the protocol. I'm like, look, I know you're going to feel so much better. This lady was miserable in and out of the hospital for blood pressure issues, panic attacks and all that. You know, they're giving her the anti-anxiety medication, but it was the mold and she just didn't follow through. So uh, yeah. I wished her well. And I said, hey, whenever you're ready, I'm here to help. But uh, you're not going to get well in that house. So there are some cases where it's bad enough on the Petri dishes that we just say, look, don't even buy the fog or just get out of there. Right. Now, how about remediation? In some cases, you can remediate, right? Yeah. In a lot of cases, you can when you get rid of the water damage material. So let's just do a little bit of role playing. Let's say that you had a bath. Let's say it's a second story. You had a bathtub you know, flood and you had water kind of dripping down from upstairs down to your main level. In that case, you know, all the insulation is going to be wet. So you're going to pull the drywall out. You're going to remove mm-hmm. all the insulation, depending on the subfloor under that bathroom area where the tile was, if the subfloor got wet, maybe some joist. Now, if it's just some like surface mold on a floor joist, you may be able to come in with like a high, high uh, percentage hydrogen peroxide. So you go to like a pool supply store, this is not a do-it-yourself podcast, but this is how you do it. Uh, you <laughs> yeah, hire, a, hire a professional to do this for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is what they would do, though, uh, a good one. So they would get like a 32% uh, hydrogen peroxide from a pool store. They would cut it in half. So then it's about 17% hydrogen peroxide. They put it in one of those like herbicide sprayers, and they would just spray any surface mold. So floor joist, you know, uh, if in your attic, you know, if you needed a spot treat, the hydrogen peroxide, boom. And then you would replace your insulation, you would replace your tile, you would replace your drywall, and then you would finish polishing it with the fog machine. And then you could yeah. probably stay. But in some cases, like in that in that one lady's case, I mean, she had like, I mean, this was like a 12,000 square foot house. I mean, she had like 7,000 square feet of damaged space. It's like, yeah, you're going to spend well 2 million just to tear it all out. So, you know. Right. Yeah. yeah. Time to get out in that case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about air purification. Uh, can air purification do well as far as keeping the mold spores, mycotoxins down in the air? Yes, definitely. However, I'm not going to say if you have a moldy apartment, you should just buy an air purifier and then be done with it. You should still try to treat first and then use the air purifier because you don't want to mm-hmm. contaminate your air filter because that's going to reduce mm-hmm. your longevity. But yeah, I mean, there are some awesome uh, filters that have carbon in them like the austin's awesome i've got like five of the austin airs they work great and uh have you heard of uh enviro cleanse i have yeah, yeah. they have earth good. mineral technology that works pretty well too yeah they're good austin's good uh, the molecule got really popular i have two mm-hmm. of those units i don't like the blue light it's really annoying at night because then i have to go turn it off i gotta like cover my eyes and turn it off so i don't blind myself at night with it because the uv light is is designed to help basically sterilize mold spores right yeah, it can yeah. sort of, I think they the term they use is like degranulate, where you can yeah. just blow these little particles so small that it's a non-issue. However, I didn't really like the plasticky smell from the molecule. So yes, I mean, you can use air purifiers. I've got some ERV systems in my house, which are basically a pipe cut in the side of your house 
where you can literally pump, assuming the outside air is fresh, mm -hmm. you can literally pump outside air into your house to kind of dilute VOCs and whatever else. And so we'll crank on the ERVs, you know, 10, 15 minutes during the day, bring some fresh air in. But yes, the air purifiers are great. And, you know, for all those people like in the wildfires, I'm yeah. hoping, like all my clients out West, they already pretty much had air purifiers going. So thank yeah. goodness they dodged a bullet, but air purifiers are not something just for fun. I mean, there's something that really, yeah. you know, increase your longevity and cognitive function. The EPA says that indoor air is like 10 times more dirty than outdoor air. So it's, it's a non-negotiable for me to have one. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, definitely you should have one ideally for like every thousand square feet or so. Uh, you should be looking to have something in there, some sort of at least good HEPA filter. Are you familiar with the Air Doctor? That's a, it's kind of a lower cost one. I found yeah. the EnviroCleanse more, it's higher cost, but it's better for people that are dealing with mold toxicity. People that are real sensitive to mold, I find the EnviroCleanse because the earth mineral technology works better than like just um, just a really good HEPA filter, like an Air yeah, Doctor. Yeah, I mean, the Air Doctor is okay. You and I are both in the affiliate marketing world. So, yeah. you know, they used to give a really awesome commission for selling those Air Doctors. And yeah. I have one and uh, I had a lot of clients purchase them. However, uh, for the price, it's like you might as well just squeeze your wallet a little tighter and and – or squeeze it a little more and squirt some more money out of there and get you a better one because it's decent, yeah. but it's not put it to you this way. I have one, but it's in my kid's playroom and it's not in my bedroom. Yeah. The Austin's in my bedroom. All right. Well, let's talk about, I know you had mentioned the binders and different binders being good for different mycotoxins. I'd like to explore that a little bit more. So you mentioned charcoal for okra toxin. Um, what are some of the other ones? Yeah, so zeolite or bentonite, you know, clays in general, are going to be good for more fusarium-based mycotoxins mm -hmm. like zeolinone, yeah. which is something we test for on the, the myco. Uh, chlorella is pretty broad spectrum. I, I do find chlorella mm -hmm. works really good for okra toxin, but chlorella can be broad spectrum in the sense that if you're going to show up with okra toxin, maybe some mycophenolic acid, maybe some citrinin people listening like, what are you saying? These are different mycotoxins yeah. you're going to test your body for on the urine sample. So if you yeah. have a urine test in front of you, you're going to see these. They will not be foreign terms anymore. Yeah. The Great Plains mycotoxin urine test is what he's referring to here. Yes. Yes. Um, pectins are pretty good. I would say pectins are kind of broad spectrum too. You know, we talk about pectins a lot for like heavy metal detox, but they can help with mold too. And then you've got like a prescription binder, which I use for a short term called cholestyramine. Mm. Uh, it's a it's a resin. So in theory, it doesn't get absorbed into the body, but it is incredibly potent for okra toxin. I used it because the natural binders just didn't feel strong enough. So for a short period of time, I did do this. It's a compounded resin and you literally just poop it out. So it doesn't add to your body. It only removes bad things. And so I, I use that. So on the prescription compound pharmacy side, uh, cholestyramine is is very helpful in some cases for me it almost immediately cleared up my vision i'm talking within mm. 30 minutes of a dose my vision was more clear and that that's an off-label use it was designed to lower cholesterol so right. but, it's a bioacid sequestrant and that's how it ga grabs onto the mold is it's grabbing onto the bile and pulling it out through the stool yeah because yeah, we can recirculate bile in fact a lot of people are doing that uh, bile is what makes our stool brown. And so if you're not moving, if you're not moving your bowels well, if you've got issues with your bile ducts, um, if you've got gut dysbiosis, those are all reasons why somebody may not be able to get uh, toxic bile out through their system. So binders can really help with that. How about fulvic and humic acids? What are your thoughts yeah, on those? They're cool. I use them. I've got, I've got a couple formulas that have them in there. I can't say specifically what they're going to do in like regards to specific mycotoxins. I would just say they're 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 fun to have at the party with everything yeah. else uh, but i can't say that you could do them by themselves i don't think mm. by themselves they would probably be enough i just don't think they're yeah. potent enough they're really gentle which is great for sensitive people but mm -hmm. you might need more firepower that's all i can say <laughs> what are the doses that you're typically using let's say with charcoal to start so let me compare and contrast my doses to uh, a guy i've heard of dr michael gray he's a toxicologist out west mm -hmm. i've heard this guy's using based on some of the clients I've seen that went to him first before they came to me, he was using like dozens and dozens and dozens of capsules of charcoal per day. We're talking like 20, 30, 40 grams of charcoal. Wow. That's a lot. I don't use that much. I use like a couple grams a day of charcoal. So typically we're going to get charcoal in like a 500 milligram 
or maybe a two, two to 500 milligram cap of charcoal. So we may do two caps twice a day. That's going to put you close to a gram. Um, I like a lot of uh, broad spectrum products too. So if we use broad spectrum, they hide it in proprietary blends. So truthfully, you don't know exactly how much you're getting. Yeah. And so you may see a label that's like 500 milligrams, but it's zeolite and bentonite and charcoal right. and whatever. So then you don't know. So I'll just have people do a couple grams extra of charcoal. And then uh, for chlorella, uh, we'll often do liquid micronized chlorella. I really love bio-raised chlorella. I take it often. My kids take it. My wife takes it. And there's this liquid. So the full dose is like two squirts twice a day. And that's plenty. I mean, over a period yeah. of time, six months to two years, you can pull a ton out. Yeah, that's cool. And and they say take activated charcoal away from meals. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I would definitely, I would definitely agree. Uh, it just can because it bind to to different food, you know, basically different minerals, things like that that are in your diet. And it's not a huge deal. I mean, based on uh, Dr. Gray's work, I mean, this guy's been using high dose charcoal, very high dose for decades, and he's never had an issue with mineral depletion. So I think it's a minimal concern, but I think just to be optimal an hour away from food or supplement is smart. Yeah. Yeah. I heard that uh, David Wolf was telling me that um, with charcoal, there's no published studies that actually say it will extract nutrients from your body or from your diet. It's more a theoretical, kind of just a theoretical model that we have at this point. Oh, I believe it. I believe it. I mean, here's the deal. I've looked at some nutrient panels on people that were doing a lot of charcoal and I've never seen any deficiencies or I've never seen, let's say an initial test, tons of charcoal retest. I've never seen minerals or anything drop. So yeah, I think it's probably a myth too, but Hey, the empty stomach idea makes sense though, because fasting does increase the excretion of toxin. Right. So if we get somebody on an intermittent fasting protocol plus binders, I really think you speed things up. The, the, the getting you well, is is sped up what do you like for an intermittent fasting protocol something simple eat dinner at 5 or 6 Mm p.m don't eat breakfast the next day eat lunch at noon yeah that's plenty long enough for me so good 16 to 18 hour fast hit the charcoal like at night uh you know near bedtime and then in the morning when you wake up or mid-morning somewhere around there yeah that's perfect yeah two caps before bed would be smart unless you have to take some kind of herbs to help you sleep see a lot of these people they don't sleep space out yeah. So these people may need to do herbs for sleep. So maybe bedtime binders is not good. But yeah, first thing in the morning, my daughter wakes me up, daddy, get out of bed. I'm like, honey, come on, 10 more minutes. <laughs> uh, so then I got to get out of bed and then uh, I'll go pop some binders and then hang out with the kids, cook some breakfast. And then by that time, an hour or so has passed and I'm ready to eat breakfast if I'm going to do breakfast or if I'm going to yeah. wait till lunch, do lunch. So yeah, that, but, but yeah, fasting is a tool. Um, I mean, you know more about fasting than I do yeah. and, and fasting is great for, for speeding this process up. So it can be very beneficial. That's good. Now you mentioned different herbs for sleep. Let's touch on that real quick. What do you like for people that are having trouble falling asleep? Sure. Yeah. I wrote a whole book on sleep. I don't uh, promote it much, but it was called Rim Rehab. It was all about my struggles with sleep after working third shift in college and wrecked myself uh, and what I did to fix it. So I like motherwort. Motherwort's really calming. It works great for heart palpitations and for blood pressure regulation. So I was originally using it for that. And I noticed it happened to really improve my deep sleep. And so I like that. I like passion flower, a little bit of tincture of that. Um, Rishi mushroom. Some call it Rishi. Rishi Rishi can be helpful for sleep. I'm a huge fan of magnolia, uh, magnolia bark. I'm a huge fan of Zisiphus, also called jujube. Zisiphus is really cool. Uh, you've got relora, which is great. Relora is actually a blend of, I think, two different barks, magnolia and something else. Relora is like a patented uh, blend that helps with cortisol regulation. So if you have a cortisol test that shows high cortisol at night, relora would be smart. Ashwagandha works for a lot of people. Um, 5-HTP can be very helpful because if you can boost serotonin, that'll increase melatonin. A low-dose melatonin is okay. I'm okay with like one to three milligrams of melatonin at night. That's yeah. fine. Uh, obviously, decompressing, not watching murder shows before you go to bed, yeah. getting off social media, getting off your phones, getting off your TVs, uh, listening to relaxing music, candling down your lights, all that stuff still counts. Epsom salt bath, lavender essential oil, all those lifestyle strategies uh, mm-hmm. help. Um, so there was one, it was, I don't know, it might've been like a, a German study or something that showed putting on socks right before bed. Mm. Not, if you have them on and then you go to bed, it doesn't help. But if you put them on right before you go to bed, it somehow help with sleep. So I don't know, maybe put some nice wool socks on. 
Uh, I notice if I get my body warm before I go to bed, that helps. So if I do like a sauna session or a, which mm. that may truthfully just be shifting the nervous system into parasympathetic. So that may be why it helps, but sauna or hot shower, you know, that can be helpful. Uh, other herbs, well, not an herb, but magnesium is awesome. I like a magnesium glycinate and or a magnesium three and eight combo for the brain. Mm. CBD oil can be helpful or just a cannabis extract in general. If you can legally get a, a blend, a little bit of THC does help some people. Uh, what else? Man, I could go on and on. Yeah, I think you cut co- you covered the gamut on that. Uh, I can't really think of too much more. Maybe some GABA um, as possible. Yeah. You know? I like pharma GABA. I like yeah. the fermented pharma GABA. That that works really good. Uh, I did experiment in the past. I wrote a book on nootropics as well. So I did, you know, play with some nootropics. However, uh, certain nootropics can get you into trouble. Um, yeah. mainly phenibit. Phenibit is one, it's a phenyl GABA, which Technically, it wouldn't be a nootropic because it is addictive, and nootropics, by definition, can't be addictive. But phenobit, phenyl GABA, uh, that helped me when I was really, really an insomniac in college. And you get really dependent on it really quickly, and there's a massive withdrawal potential. So I would probably not not do that unless you had a doctor helping you. Yeah, better to stick with some of these herbs, which uh, are non-toxic and non you, you don't end up developing an addiction to ashwagandha and things like that. And, um, you know, some chamomile tea, I think, uh, I think you had mentioned chamomile, chamomile or lemon or, um, passion flower or lemon balm actually is, is another good one. Valerian. Um, and a lot of times you could find tea mixes that have combination of these herbs that can be really soothing and some sort of warmth, like you were talking about, like a warm bath can be really helpful. Warm tea, just drinking the warm tea can be really, really helpful as well. Um, again, that starts to stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system, and uh, helps you relax better. So really good. Yeah. Yep. Double bag of chamomile can go a long way. Oh yeah. Yeah. Got to double bag it. That's right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, this has been a great interview, Evan. Uh, just so good. And people, you got, you guys can find him at evanbrand.com. He also has a great podcast as well. Any last words of inspiration for our audience? Yeah. I would just tell people, keep your head up. Uh, keep asking questions. Keep asking why. Keep investigating. Don't assume you found the silver bullet because there is no silver bullet. And it's really a multifactorial, complicated puzzle. And I don't say that it's a complicated puzzle to overwhelm you. I say that because it's the reality. And if you go all in on parasites, you're going to strike out because that's what I did. If you go all in on Lyme, you're going to strike out. If you go all in on mold, you're going to strike out. If you go all in on H. pylori, you're going to strike out. So you really need to get all of the puzzle pieces gathered. That's the first step. And then I'm biased because that's what I do every day, but work with a clinician, someone who's done this a thousand times who can help guide you through the proper protocol. Because I assure you, you spend more money and you spend more time, just like I did, building a supplement graveyard because you bought 20 things you heard about on a podcast or a summit. You tried them all now. You don't even know what the heck they're doing. And there they are sitting in the pantry going bad and you're no better off. So, you know, hire somebody like me or somebody else who's, who's you know, been in the trenches for a while and uh, get yourself better. Absolutely. Good stuff. So evanbrand.com, you can find out more information about Evan and his coaching program. Thanks again, again, Evan, for for joining us here on the summit. And everybody, we will see you on a future podcast. Be blessed.